Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from. Uh, we have people from all over the world. We have an amazing webinar today, Healthcare Social Marketing in 2018, and I am joined with some fantastic panelists. But as you are probably accustomed to in webinars, just have to go over a few things here. Um, number one, and, and probably the, the, the number one question we get is if you like what you see, we'll be sending you a recording afterwards. So if you have to leave at any point in time, uh, no worries there. We'll have that in your inbox if you want to share it with your team. Also ignore the bottom left social and higher education. This is healthcare. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the GoToWebinar question box where we will uh, answer them throughout or save them for the end, depending on the content. And if you want to get social, obviously this is a social media webinar and Sprout is a social media company. Please feel free to jump in on Twitter using the hashtag SproutWebinar. So what are we going to talk about today? First, we're going to uh, introduce you to the individuals who are joining us to talk about uh, healthcare marketing, talk through just very, very briefly the importance of social media and healthcare. I'm sure everyone here understands the value, but then we'll really discuss uh, all the common challenges that you may be seeing in healthcare marketing, as well as how you can solve them. This is where we'll have you know, the free form panel discussions. We're also going to give you some, some actionable takeaways with some tips on how to improve your social media presence starting today. Um, and then we'll go through any of the questions that are submitted throughout the webinar. So without further ado, I will kick it over to RJ if you want to introduce yourself um, to the group. Yeah, thank you, Michael. My name is RJ Martino, and I'm president and CEO of iProv. We've been doing healthcare marketing for about the last decade, and excited to present to you guys today everything that we've learned over the last decade. Uh, my background is in computer science, and uh, I'm also a licensed attorney. Uh, I spend lots of my time speaking to C-suites about marketing in the healthcare space. Uh, alongside me, I've got Chelsea. Chelsea, you want to give them a little background on yourself? Sure. Um, I am the social media manager at iProv. Um, so I am the person behind the computer screen typing away every day for all of our clients on their social media platforms. Um, I'm also a healthy living and lifestyle blogger. So I've been involved in influencer marketing for about two and a half years. So I've connected with a lot of different brands and companies just to you know, help them with marketing and apply it to my own blog and just get all their information out there for my readers. So I kind of have a lot of different background with social media, but I love it and I think it can just do so much for healthcare. So it's really awesome. I'm excited for today. Great, yeah. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Sarah Guevara. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the enterprise account executive covering the Southeast for Sprout Social. Uh, my background is kind of a mix of marketing and healthcare. So I've spent about the past four years working with healthcare industry um, for, a, for a large SaaS company. And prior to that, I worked with Kaiser Permanente um, on the healthcare and health insurance side. So my background is, is definitely a mix of healthcare, uh, marketing, and uh, media. So thanks for having me. Great. And initially, I wasn't going to put my face up here, but uh, they had asked me to. So my name is Michael. I've been at Sprout for four or five years now, creating content like webinars and blog posts and guides across a number of different industries. And really excited to talk about healthcare because it is you know, so unique. But before we actually jump into some of this content, we wanted to launch this quick poll to see you know, what kind of organizations that, that you're all working with, whether that's a healthcare provider, um, you know, healthcare technology, life science, uh, maybe dental or, or some other. Poll should be running now. I like waiting for the results here. My guess is <laughs> most people here are healthcare providers, if I'm guessing. Um, I'm see the results. If you well, yeah, I think uh, it's definitely looking like it's it's in your favor here. Um, you can check as many boxes as as you see fit. Um, and this way, we can really cater the conversation around um, around everyone else. But uh, unfortunately, yeah. with the technology, we were only able to add like five responses. So it does look like the other is accumulating more than the rest. I'm going to close that out so we can get into it and share the results here. So it looks like 46 percent. Um, choosing the healthcare provider option. Um, some dentists on the line, which is amazing. We just wrote a lot of uh, great dentist blog posts as a blog post about marketing. And then other. So um, I think that everybody's certainly gonna find value from the session today. 
Um, but let's let's talk about iProv real quick and then um, you know lend a little context as to why you're joining us. Sure. So we started iProv in 2001, and in the beginning, we were doing a lot of traditional advertising. Uh, we were doing a lot of website development, uh, and we began fo focusing primarily on the healthcare space uh, just in the last couple of years. And it is very unique. Uh, but the great thing about it is that we have been able to be been very successful at driving new patient population to our clients. Uh, and on the digital space, as everybody on this webinar knows, it's really uh, e I don't want to say easy, but it's a lot easier to tie results to the tactics that we're doing. Uh, so it has been just a beautiful marriage for both our healthcare clients and for us as an agency. Great. Yeah. And then Sarah, if you want to give just a little brief summary about what we do here at Sprout. Yeah. So Sprout Social, um, awesome social media platform that's headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. So I've been around for getting close to, I would say, eight, eight to 10 years um, and used by more than 24,000 brands across the globe. So uh, we're spread out about, across 100 different countries and have a quarter of a million profiles connected to our platform. Um, and so we're processing um, over 500 million messages a month for our customers. Um, so you can check us out online. I would say our biggest growth coming from the, the SaaS background, the reason why people love Sprout Social so much compared to all the um, major social media platforms out there is because number one, super easy to use regardless of if you're a you know, five person shop to 10,000. Um, and we really have amazing customer success. So we're always here to help you. Um, as you you grow your social media strategy. All right, yeah. Um, what I've just realized now is I jumped the gun a little bit on the poll, but as we saw, the organizations are primarily healthcare providers with some dental organizations and then other. But um, kind of wanted to just talk about the importance of healthcare. Uh, I'm gonna go over this briefly, very briefly for everyone's sake. Um, you know, as you know, healthcare is probably one of the, the oldest industries out there, and there's this stigma that healthcare may be a bit behind in terms of, of the more modern and digital marketing. Um, but, you know, in order to succeed, that can no longer be the case, and, and it's time to start embracing a lot of the, um, the different digital inbound platforms out there. Uh, today, we're talking about social media because there is so much value when it comes to, um, you know, acquiring new patients or engaging with those that you already have. Um, you know, really listening for key trends and helping that inform your inbound strategy. So we start to talk about, you know, why is social so key? Uh, so today's, you know, social is where your clients are looking for recommendations, whether that be from their doctors and uh, the healthcare providers themselves, or if they're just posting online looking for feedback. And, you know, by tapping into some of those conversations, you can find some long-term patients and, and customers and help scale your practice. Uh, some of the nice stats we have here is that, uh, you know, 50% of 57% uh, of people decide where to get treatment based on a provider's social media presence. So that's obviously more of the patient side, but when it comes to the actual practitioner side, 60% of doctors feel that social media improves the quality of care they give patients. And to me, that seems, you know, when you can build a community of, of, of fellow doctors or, or dentists and things like that, really tapping into the best information possible out there. Um, some of the other healthcare and social media marketing benefits is just educating your patients um, through posting social content and really becoming a trusted resource online when it does come time for those people to, to turn to um, an actual provider. Um, facilitating collaboration, obviously chatting with other peers in the industry and using social media to join groups or to just follow other thought leaders in the space. And it's just expanding your awareness. Um, you know, healthcare marketing helps you reach those target audiences. And by leveraging different trends and, and social media listening and tools like that, it becomes a lot more efficient and it helps you scale that inbound. So these are the, some of the common challenges that when we tapped into uh, the healthcare audience that we have here at Sprout Social, which is fairly large, and we asked them, you know, what are some of the, the issues that you face? So as we go through some of these issues, I'm going to launch this poll to see, you know, out of everyone here on the line, which of these are common challenges for you? Is that maintaining compliance within industry regulations, uh, finding a way to humanize your healthcare brands, 
appealing to those customers who use social for research. So we know that they are using social, but how do you actually tap in and, and start to um, drive them back to your homepage or, or any place that they can make an appointment? And then there's also leveraging social media for the different seasonality or during a health crisis. So um, creating campaigns around flu season or cold season, or if there is some sort of public health crisis, um, whether it be Zika in 2016, there's something like Ebola, how do you educate your audience and, and also you know, give them the right information at the right time? You know, I don't. I don't think we need to uh, beat a dead horse with the importance of social and healthcare. But there are a couple other uh, stats that I really like to lean on, and one of them is 75% of Americans use social media to research their symptoms. And I just think it's funny because I know personally I do it. The second there is a symptom that I'm trying to figure out what's going on, uh, that's where we all are turning. Is you know not just online research, but specifically social media as well. Yeah, I had to delete the WebMD application off my phone because I would look <laughs> at it way too often when even something of the slightest came up. So let's close this out here and share some of the results we see. So it seems like the biggest thing is um, is really using social media to appeal to consumers who are using social for research. Um, it, we have some great strategies for turning those individuals who are doing research into actual uh, candidates. Humanizing your healthcare brands, some great tips there. and Obviously, we have a, a licensed attorney on the line to talk about the, the compliance piece. So let me hide these results and uh, jump back into the content. Uh, once again, I, I didn't do the poll during the poll screen. Um, so the number one challenge that we're talking about here, how, well, one of the challenges, how can you maintain compliance on social media with industry regulations? And I'm going to push this right to you, RJ, as the attorney on the line. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, this is one of those questions we get all the time from clients, especially clients who at a C-level are really worried about industry regulations. You know, 10 years ago, uh, when you marketed, you typically marketed in a piece of paper and it was hard to change. It was there. It was permanent forever. And the number of pieces that went out were, was on a much lower number than what's going out today. And so uh, there was a lot of thought behind it. Uh, on will this meet compliance? It's changed. You know, today, what we really look at and what most of our marketers fail to think about, and even our C level suite, is what is the purpose of the compliance or the regulations? You know, why did we put compliance and regulations in place in the first place? What is the primary purpose for those things? And for the most part, it's for protecting patient information or protecting the patient. And so, what I always urge people to think about is start thinking about it like a marketer, but not just any marketer, but an actual educator. Uh, where you get yourself into trouble with compliance and regulations is typically what we'd call traditionally as sales speak. It's making promises that you know you might not be able to back up. It's sharing or targeting specific patient information. And so from a marketing perspective, we should look at this and say, let's not make sales speak, let's educate. Let's not make sales speak. Let's just tell people our story. And if you if you stay in that path, if you, if you stay in your lane, and as, as, as marketers, what we want to do is we want to educate people. If we do that, we're not even a, we're not even going to touch the compliance, the regulation problems that most of our C-level executives are really afraid of. So I want to turn this problem on its head and say, look, if you're worried about compliance and industry regulation, you might be on the wrong webinar. It might be the fact that you're not thinking about this as a real marketer, uh, but you've got your sales hat on too much. Yeah, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you know, if you do run into those companies that get you know very nervous about it, do you do you often find that you create social media policies, or is that something that you recommend for these organizations that may be overly sensitive? Well, you know, that's one of the things that we always uh, have to do. If you are in a heavily regulated industry or something where compliance is a big problem and it's hard to make statements without touching or getting near that line, the first thing we really want to do is we want to build a policy. Uh, we want to make sure our voice and our tone are accurate. We want to make sure that when we are speaking, we're staying in our lane and we're, we're, we're not touching that uh, regulation or compliance problems that you might run into. Uh, so that policy is one of the first things we do with a lot of our clients. Yeah, I think what we like to just try to aim for is just getting to know our clients, you know, just 
find their voice and really figure out where their audience is, who they're trying to reach, and just keeping an open communication line with them so that we know, you know, what lines we can cross, what lines we really can't cross, and just try to keep them, you know, on board with us so that we always know as we're posting that they're completely aware of everything that we're posting and that we make sure to keep, you know, any and all patient information out of social media. So we just, we definitely try to, that is our top priority for sure with the social media marketing for healthcare. And I'm sure, Sarah, you've probably spoken with some clients that that are really concerned about, you know, creating a policy as well or having some pre-created assets that their clients can use. Is that something you see quite often when you're uh, chatting with healthcare? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm definitely going to defer to the lawyer uh, on the call <laughs> when talking about staying in compliance with healthcare. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something that um, every healthcare marketer feels, uh, whether they're talking about um, social media, whether they're, they're working on email campaigns, um, whether they're thinking about letters, but um, going back um, to what we were saying earlier, just making sure that the content you're putting out um, is not going um, to, uh, or is staying in your lane as RJ was saying. So, but I'll keep deferring to him uh, for the compliance week. Well, I think uh, I think a, a couple things that you can do as marketers, uh, and we've touched on them, but I want to make it crystal clear. Uh, the first thing is developing a policy. What are your marketers allowed to do, and where do they actually need to raise their hand and get approval from leadership? The second thing you really need to do is have some kind of approval process so that whenever something does touch that line, whenever you actually need to get approval, uh, making sure that that's documented, but also having tools in place. And, uh, you know, we're Sprout users, and, and that's one of the things that it does is the approval process for us. Uh, but on all pieces of marketing is having a tool that helps uh, the approval process. And the last thing is developing a library of approved content. So once you have stuff approved, man, you treat that like gold and you make sure that it's accessible for all of the marketers across the board. Because something as simple as a client testimonial needs approval. Once you get it, you can use it on, on future uh, on future outlets. So build a library of the stuff that's already been approved because as everybody on this call knows, getting approval, once something actually needs approval, getting that approval can sometimes be the hardest thing. So let's get it once and let's maintain a good library of it. Yeah, repurposing I think is definitely the name of the game uh, when it comes to just marketing in general and especially healthcare with all the approvals and um, I think we've all seen cases online where some marketing has gone potentially awry and, and people have gotten in trouble. So it's really nice tips to stay, to stay compliant and stay ahead of it. So moving on to the next challenge, and this is actually the uh, number one challenge that everybody on the line had is, is how can healthcare and life science brands humanize their social media presence? And we're going to push it to, to Chelsea first as, as kind of on the front lines of creating and publishing content. What have you found to be some of the best ways to humanize a social presence for healthcare? You know, I, I totally agree that this is just, this is huge. And um, this is what I've really just focused on so much with my social media marketing for uh, healthcare with IPROV. And um, I mean, with keeping compliance, you know, at the top of your mind, there's plenty of content that you can create for your social media platforms. And um, there's things like providing, you know, staff spotlight showing information about your doctors or staff that work at the facility and um, that's just that's really my favorite way to humanize these providers because you know honestly the biggest thing with healthcare i feel like is that it has kind of a negative connotation to it where people fear going to the doctor or fear going to the dentist. It's not, I mean, sometimes you go there for good things, but a lot of the time you go there when you're sick and so you're scared, you don't know who you're going to be facing. And it just helps to bring realness to your social media, you know, audience. You're going to show them that these doctors or providers are actual human beings. They're just like your mom, dad, sister, friend. So just being able to show their background and show maybe like these spotlights to ask them personal questions, maybe like what their favorite restaurant in town is or maybe even where they went to school just basic information so that you can show that these doctors are not scary but they're actual human beings so I think that's the most important thing to really focus on is to get those spotlights out there that's one of my favorites so 
Um, also, I like to do things like a lot of different social posts on being involved with the community. So I think that's one of our clients' main focuses is just to show that they are involved in their local community and that they are, you know, going to these events. So whenever we have uh, different clients that are involved in, you know, athletic events or just different things around the community, we like to get pictures of that for social so that we can show, you know, how involved they are, what they like to do, you know, even on the weekends, whenever they're not just doing, you know, eight to five healthcare type things, but they're out in the world, you know, supporting their community so I like to do those posts you know pretty frequently we like to keep those at the top um, on our editorial calendar and we also like to do uh, a lot of different things with just trying to show that the facility that these patients are going to, we like to get them familiar with where they're going. So getting a lot of different pictures and videos of the actual location, you know, just around the office, like what is a day in the life of going to the doctor going to look like for these patients so that they know right whenever they walk in, like, okay, this is where I'm going to sit and wait for my visit. So just basic things like that, just to kind of walk through, you know, how, what the office looks like. So just to familiarize these patients with where they're going to be going, I think is huge. I like to research things like that whenever I'm looking for a doctor or dentist or anything like that. It just kind of eases the tension and stress just so that you kind of know what you're walking into. So I feel like there's just so many different options whenever it comes to just trying to humanize the brands, but I think those are definitely my favorite ways to focus, you know, on our social platform for our clients. Yeah, those also like a great way to kind of take the fear out of going to all these places that you may uh, ordinarily be kind of a, a bit afraid to go to. Um, Arjun, yeah. did you have, I, I think we talked about algorithm changes uh, as we went through this deck, right? And kind of some of the ways yeah. to humanize your brand there. Well, you know, I, I want to I talk one thing about our biggest struggle as an agency, and that's typically, again, working with leadership in a traditional hospital sense or leadership that have, has been in healthcare for so long is a fear of actually, as you heard the tactics, so many of our tactics were humanizing the brands by showcasing both the providers, uh, the nurses, the administrative staff, and for a lot of our organizations, they want to say, yeah, but that doesn't push my brand. I want to be talking about my hospital or whatever is on the building's name. And so a lot of times we're spending time telling and educating our clients that your brand is your people. Uh, our own internal research tells us that uh, before we start our marketing efforts, about 70% of your traffic is, is coming to the site because of the people in your organization. So they might be Googling Dr. XYZ and they come to your website because that's 70% of the traffic. What's really interesting about that is if you look at that 70% of the traffic, 60 to 70%, depending on uh, the industry, is actually still calling the, the primary phone number. So they come in because of your people, but they still follow the process of a general user. Even if we put contact information for our specific providers, they're still following that same intake process. So as an organization, your brand is your people. As an organization, you can still control the relationship because they come in through your traditional intake process. So a lot of times we tell people these uh, tactics that, that Chelsea just described and they say, oh, that, that sounds like small business. No, your brand is your people. So let's humanize the brand. Uh, the other thing, uh, just to capitalize on what Michael was just saying, is that Facebook has destroyed uh, the engagement and the algorithm now as a brand. If we simply post as a brand, it is not going to show up in people's feed. We don't get the engagement that we used to. I always laugh at Chelsea because I can remember the good old days when we could literally post anything engaging. And as long as it was engaging, we would get so much visibility from our potential patients. Those days are long gone. Like I said, if we post something as a brand, we get very little engagement. Where do we get the most engagement? It's by actually telling our story of our people, the pictures of the staff and the nurses, the pictures of the doctors, being able to shoot a video saying why a doctor got started in the first place. That not only humanizes the brand, but it gives us exposure on social media that we just don't get by posting messages like, we're the best, we're the longest lasting, and we've been here forever. Those don't work anymore. Yeah, and I think that, that that plays nicely to something that Sarah could speak to, which is this idea of of leveraging, you know, your employees as these brand advocates in order to increase your reach. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm what I'm seeing a lot of our customers and and a lot of just uh, different organizations throughout every vertical these days um, is leveraging employees. So uh, all the talk on social media that you hear these days, a lot of it's about influencers. Who are our influencers are in our industry? Who's got the most followers, the most likes, that kind of thing? Um, but what about your own employees? Uh, if you're running a, a shop where um, your employees are proud to be there, they're happy to say, this is the organization I work for and here's all the good we're doing um, for our patients, for our customers in our community. How can you leverage those employees to, to, to be your advocates on social? How can you use them to say, hey, look what this organization did in the community today. Let's hear um, some thought leadership pieces from our nurse or let's hear from our doctor or whoever um, that, that leader at your organization may be to, to get to their, their reach. So if we're thinking about the Facebook algorithm and the fact that we want to see people's posts versus company posts, how can you leverage your people to help organically expand that reach? And there are tools like Sprout has for employee advocacy um, just to help you um, grow that reach among your audience. Um, another thing to think about in healthcare, so humanizing your social presence. We talk a lot about patients. We talk a lot about the consumers. But in my experience in healthcare, it is a very B2B and B2C environment. So most people are appealing to not only those patients um, or those end user consumers if you're healthcare tech, um, but they're also uh, appealing to organizations. Are we selling something to a company like wellness or insurance? Do we need uh, providers to refer them to our radiology staff? Or are we partnering with all of these different organizations? So another way to appeal and to humanize your social presence online is to also think about what kind of content are you putting out there from a B2B perspective? Um, what I've noticed and what I've heard from a lot of my customers is that you know doctors aren't always reading their email they're busy they're they're going out uh, what they want they don't want sales messages they want thought leadership pieces think about that scientific mind of your um the person who's going to be buying from you uh, whether that's the scientific mind of the doctor or whoever that is in your uh, prospect or the consumer and the patient so think about how can you say here's things that are going on here are hot topics um, in the healthcare world, how can we create content to talk about those topics in a way that maybe a physician would like or in the way that a consumer would like and put that out on your social media channels. So with video content being king right now as well, how could maybe you interview someone on your staff to talk about a hot topic and then put that video out on social media? So different ways to kind of think about, okay, here are the people that we work with, and here's the content that really resonates um, within our uh, consumer and B2B industries. Yeah, all great strategies there. Um, and unless uh, RJ or Chelsea wanted to add some more, I, I think we can move on to the next challenge. Yeah, definitely. So I, I know we talk a lot about um, these individuals being on social media and they're asking questions and they're forming communities and they're looking for help but how can the brands actually appeal to customers on social media channels? And as we went through the deck, I know that we talked a lot about, you know, engaging with customers, um, both positive and negative. If RJ, if you wanted to speak to that a bit. Yeah, I think uh, one of the simplest answers I can give on appealing to customers on social media channels uh, goes back to the good old days and I keep bringing up the good old days because it's so different than it was five years ago and you know if you look at a a traditional healthcare office now phones being answered is so important because customers will tell you all the time I hate calling and I can't get an appointment losing a, a patient because someone didn't answer the phone is unacceptable to most leaders in a healthcare organization what they don't realize is research tells us 49% of the people uh, expect to hear back from a provider on social media. So half the people expect it. The other people might not expect it, uh, but you know what they're thinking. So the first thing I say is pick up the phone. If that phone is ringing, you would answer it. In fact, you would fire someone if they didn't pick up the phone. Uh, 
Yet on social media, you'll see it on, on most providers' pages. They literally just won't respond to customers or to patients. And so my first uh, and easy response is pick up the phone, respond to people, uh, be listening. And I think it's just important just to keep in mind, just to be active on social media and just be aware of your reputation out there. I know that I'm not the only one that's really noticed a big pickup on Facebook with, you know, whenever people are asking for recommendations for different types of things out there. Um, you know, healthcare, I feel like people are asking, you know, who is your family doctor? You know, why do you like them? Why do you go there? Who's a good dentist in this area? Who would you recommend? So those are huge things that you can really, you know, amp up for you as a provider. You can get your name out there and word of mouth is huge for marketing you want to have you want to have a good name out there that people are sharing good news about you um, but it, you know if you do get negative reviews it's important to respond to those as well so I think just being really aware of your presence on social media and just making sure to make it a priority to be you know active and respond to your customers patients whoever's contacting you through social media I think that's very important so we talked uh, being available and now being aware. Uh, one of the third tactical things that we really like to focus on is localizing our message as much as possible. Uh, there's a lot of people who will see someone because they're in their hometown. And so as much as we can, we are targeting our audience. And the, that targeting can be based on an ailment. It can also just be specifically on a location. Uh, so we are always targeting our messaging based off of our audience. Let me ask, do you ever find success or, or look into writing out different trends in the area as well or, or listening for certain topics and then trying to jump in on that message as well? Or have you ever had clients that, that ask you to do that for them, but it may not seem relevant? Uh, it's interesting. We, whenever we actually pull and show the client how often people are talking about something that they could solve they're always surprised by it so there are listening tools where you can listen to the conversations that are happening around you and we do utilize those things all the time now for a traditional provider and maybe a marketer who might be the sole marketer for an organization that might be a a lot of effort but there is so much value out there right now yeah, and I would say, um, just piggybacking on, on what uh, we're saying um, throughout this conversation is, you know, we're, we're putting out content that we want to appeal to customers, whether that's things like RJ was saying, we're listening online, what are the conversations going on right now? Like if we're, if we're in a specific industry within healthcare and life sciences, let's listen across the web, let's listen across Twitter and online to see what are people talking about? What's the sentiment towards a certain topic? And if there are certain things that are trending, let's put some content out there um, that's going to appeal to customers because that's what they want to know. Um, and then what's also important is when you put that content out, whether that's through your own social channels, having your employees put that content out, that as people are commenting, uh, like we were saying earlier, make sure you're, you're responding back. Um, engage that person in conversation. Um, like Chelsea was saying, it's not just about getting as many likes and it's not just about getting as many comments. It's about, are we humanizing ourselves? Are we appealing to customers by answering their questions, potentially driving them to, to visit us, to visit our website, wherever that may be, um, when we're putting that content out there? And then think of beyond your own social channels too. Um, are there LinkedIn groups out there where people are talking about things in your industry? Can you join those conversations online, on Twitter, on, on LinkedIn, on Facebook? Are there conversations you can join and make yourself a thought leader in there uh, and potentially generate more and more um, uh, relevant uh, prospects, relevant customers for you? And make sure like, you have a tool again where you can manage that inbox and, and respond to people as they come in. Um, I would say that's, the, that's the, probably the most important thing is, is continuing to engage um, and listen for, for what's important out there. I yeah, and I think yeah i'm sorry uh so one of the uh, uh data points that i like to drop is from google when they tell us one in 20 searches are healthcare related searches so one in 20 searches that happen on google are healthcare related another fact that we like to share is 12.4 12.4 is the number of resources that people have checked before they ever step foot into a provider's office 
12.4. So, you know, you're talking about content and, you know, do we do this kind of content? Our push is really let's produce more content because people are searching for it. Uh, that being said, one of the things that uh, Sarah triggered in my memory, another good thing is actually leading those discussions. You'd be surprised how few groups there are and how many people are out there looking for people uh, to, looking for groups to join, communities to join, so that they can talk to other people with similar ailments. So that could be something as simple as a Facebook group creating your own Facebook group and controlling that conversation. And I hate using the word controlling because it's not controlling. It's literally just giving them a voice of people that they can talk to, uh, but being able to be part of that conversation, uh, we've seen a lot of success in as well. Completely. And uh, everything that we've discussed so far kind of reminded me that I had this slide on the back burner that I wasn't going to show, but just pointing out here is just to give a visualization of, you know, you can create like these different word clouds and you can find out all this data that people are associating with certain things like healthcare and leverage that because obviously these are going to be what's triggering the organic search. And these are the things that people are talking about at the time. Um, this is just something uh, from Sprout, but they just wanted to give a little uh, credence to that. But obviously, it's it's it can be somewhat a divisive industry so i would assume that the the thought is to be kind of wary as you jump into these conversations yep. i think it's really important sorry go ahead Sarah. oh cool. sorry um i was just going to say one important thing to do is utilize your own employees to find out when when people are coming to you with problems whether that's um healthcare problems whether that's whatever it is that your company um will will solve what are the common questions that people ask? What are their fears? What are their concerns? What are the barriers to getting them to come to you in the first place? Take that content and again, let's go back to humanizing it. Interview the, the staff about what are these common fears? What are these common questions? And put that out on social media to really appeal to customers to come across as a thought leader and to remove those barriers to getting someone in the door. So go ahead, Chelsea. Oh, I was just about to say kind of the same thing. It's just really, mo I think it's huge to just get to know who your audience is. You know, get to know who your potential patients are going to be out there and how you can better communicate with them, what it is that you can provide for them, and, you know, what you're an expert in. So, you know, if you are an OBGYN clinic, you know, what type of information are your reviewers or followers, readers, patients going to be looking for? So be familiar with that and keep that at, you know, top of your mind whenever you're sharing social media content. You don't want to just share, you know, random things, but you want it to direct these patients to your clinic just so that they know whenever they come to your social media website or sites that they know exactly what they're going to find. And just keep the content valuable. You want to keep it interesting so that these patients keep following you. You know, with these algorithms, it's easy to be hidden, you know, behind all these other pages and posts through social media. But if you can keep your content valuable and full of really good information, I feel like your patients will just, you know, engage more. They'll stay on top of what you're posting and you'll get just a lot more engagement every single time you post something. So I just think it's the most important thing to just be super familiar with your audience and what type of people you really are aiming to reach for. That sounds great. Yeah, and I think that the last thing in this I wanted to bring up, which segues into the next topic, is one of my favorite uh, topics that we discussed here, chatbots, um, and how you can leverage those to for engagement. Um, I know, RJ, you had some thoughts on this. Is it is it something that the healthcare marketing community should embrace? Yeah, you know, uh, one of the, it, it's like anything else, the hardest step is that first step forward. It's, uh, uh, there's a hundred ways to say it, but actually starting a conversation with someone is the hardest part of getting someone to open up, is saying something that triggers them to respond to you. Once that door gets opened, the flow of conversation happens a lot quicker. One of the things I'm most excited about, uh, and and I'm getting a lot of resistance from clients, uh, is chatbots. Because the word chatbots is so unappealing to most people, nobody wants to start with a robot. But utilizing chatbots just to start the conversation is a great way to start a conversation. So uh, one of one of the things we're looking forward to is utilizing those things just to ask a simple question. Uh, is there something I can help you with today? Are you looking for someone today? Do you currently work with Dr. Joe already? All of those things are easy, automated, 
and allow that first conversation to happen without the need of us putting in the effort. So as marketers, we should embrace this. As leadership within the healthcare industry, we should realize that we, as marketers, are putting barriers around how deep these bots are going. I'm not telling you to use bots to get uh, patient information. That's not where the use is. The use is automating that first touch, opening the door so as marketers, as healthcare providers, we can do our job better. Yeah, that's where I think it, it blends into the next challenge of, you know, how should brands use social media channels for seasonality or during crisis and to kind of spell the difference. Seasonality being potentially the flu season, cold season, allergies, something where uh, a campaign will come up continuously and you can kind of plan for and create content for versus a crisis, um, a potential outbreak or something happens where, you know, your inbox becomes flooded with messages of uh, concerned patients saying, you know, should I worry about X, Y, and Z? And I think that that is potentially one of the best places for chatbots. Um, what would you think about that? Would you be correct in thinking that? No, I think that's a great example of a way that you can utilize chatbots now. Uh, but going back to the questions on how should brands use social channels for season seasonality and during and during a crisis uh, is a funny question to me because uh, going back with my experience, you know, five, ten years ago, switching gears was so hard. It was already printed in this year, in this quarter's newsletter. We published all of our marketing messages on television and radio already this year. We can't respond to this in November or December during flu season. With social media, this is the place where most of our patients are going first to see the information. So if you want to uh, be seasonal with your message, if you want to respond to a crisis, social channels is where you should start. This shouldn't be an afterthought here. This is actually where the messaging starts. Uh, and it is so much easier than it was in uh, traditional advertising. But this is a really good uh, usage of chat bots is uh, when people come to get that information, we can start with that topic because we know most of the time that's what they're coming to us for anyways. Yeah, I think that covers the crisis aspect really well. And Chelsea, I'm sure stuff for the seasonality um, you probably have a content calendar created far in advance, right? For some of these different things like flu, cold, allergy seasons. Oh yeah, definitely. That's our for sure thing that we keep, you know, around all the time. You can just generate so much content with that. Just knowing that you can be ahead of the game, you know, for these uh, social media channels for the providers, you can show the potential patients that, you know, they're already thinking about flu season or they already have information of, you know, where you can go to to get your flu shot or, you know, when it's allergy season, here's some tips on how to get a jump start on what to do for that. Um, so I think it's super important to just kind of have a calendar so that you can have it in eyes view so that you know that, you know, what's coming up and how you can create just tons and tons of content for those providers just to show that they're aware of everything that's going on and that they're there to help and that they're experts in that field. And Sarah, I'm sure you've seen customers with months and months planned out of their publishing calendars for such things, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, depending on what industry you're in in healthcare, it can be your Super Bowl season. So if it's flu season, if it's open enrollment, if you're launching a healthcare tech product, um, making sure well in advance that you've got some really great content to go out. Um, that's just really going to help with your credibility in general. Um, getting that content out, be ready to engage, whether that's um, having that chat bot ready for the crisis, like what can we help you with, and then pointing people in the right direction, um, or just get, having that content ready to go. Um, it's going to help people feel more connected to you. Um, and it's gonna get them the information that they need. Um, the person who has the information out first is typically the person that, that they're gonna go with. Um, so yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big time in healthcare to, to get the best content you can. No, that's a great point about being there first. Um, perfect. So it kind of wraps up the challenges that we had, but we have some, some really interesting tips to, um, to stay kind of interesting and compliant on social media as well. And, you know, first I asked um, RJ and Chelsea if they could go over, you know, kind of one of their case studies that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of started from a very small online presence and you scaled it all the way up. And, you know, maybe there's some tips and tricks there that well, I don't want to say tricks because that's not the right word. Tips and strategies that helped you scale that. Yeah. Um, Chelsea, I think I'll lead us off with uh, some of the things that we did, but uh, we had a, 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 
OBGYN that was really wanting to grow. Uh, and we talked a lot about these same things we talked about today. And, you know, they felt some of the pressures uh, that, you know, you or maybe your leadership team is uh, feeling now, which is it's overwhelming. We're worried about the compliance side. We don't know what to say. We practice medicine. We are not marketers. And so our presentation to them was let's get started. Let us help you with a backflow. Let us help with the messaging. And honestly, there is no secret sauce. There, there isn't, uh, you know, fish oil or snake oil that we're selling. It is just a lot of hard work. It's being available and it is the activity. It's publishing the content. It's, it's honing in on your message. And by doing a lot of the standard stuff, we saw some of the results that you see on your screen now. We saw engagement fly through the roof. We saw them move from an average of about 75 patients a day, I think, uh, to having over a 200, uh, 200 patient day. Uh, they've moved into new space and they've hired additional physicians as well. Uh, the results can be amazing if you put in the effort, but make no bones about it, you've got to put the effort in. Seriously amazing results there. Um, no surprise, though, having heard you both speak on this webinar. So if we get into um, a bit more of the tactical content, we just released the Sprout Social Index, which looks at you know, hundreds of thousands of messages across different, um, different verticals. And, and one thing that we found, we pulled out and extracted some data for hospitals and healthcare, is the number one consumer content preference is that educational content. So um, content you could put out there that teaches your, your, you know, your audience about how to deal with a certain thing or, you know, just how to be healthy, things like that. Second to this, uh, number two being news. So trying to stay, um, to Sarah's point about being first out there, breaking this news and all this information that's helpful. Um, with the third being product information. But, and I, and this is where I talked to Chelsea a bit is that it doesn't all have to be super dry like that. It doesn't mean you can't have any fun. And this is a post we found from United Healthcare, which is actually taking advantage of that hashtag holiday, National Corn on the Cob Day. Um, and I think Chelsea, you said that you you've done a couple of publishing or you posted a couple of things like this, right? I have. They're actually just, they're such fun things that you can really do all kinds of different things with. You know, um, the other day was National Donut Day, which, you know, there's a holiday now pretty much for everything. So um, I have a calendar that I kind of keep an eye on for those. But I got to ask uh, one of our audiences, you know, what is one thing that you, if you were craving uh, this certain thing during your pregnancy, what would your child's name be? And, you know, it went crazy, like all kinds of different people, you know, came up with the funniest responses for what their children's name would be based on their cravings during pregnancy. So just little things like that. You can get creative and just have so much content without having to worry about, you know, putting too much patient or putting patient information out there. So it's just kind of using your own creativity. And like I said, just being familiar with your audience and knowing the provider's voice, you know, how do they want to be with their audience? Of course, you want them to be professional, but you want to keep social media social and conversational so you want the people on the other end to engage with you so in order for them to engage you have to put something out there that's interesting so that is why these are perfect i love sharing those that reminds me we actually have uh we keep track of all the hashtag holidays as well we keep an infographic that i can send to you after this and of course everyone on the line if you want to reach out to at sprout social um you'll actually hear from the person that uh keeps it so that is uh, a nice little takeaway there as well. And I think this is something that we had talked about uh, a bit earlier, which is actually leveraging those employee advocates. So um, Stewart Healthcare, which is uh, a client of Sprout Social, there actually is some handouts within the go-to that, that talks about their use case. Um, they had somebody who had reached out and said, excited to join the team. And then that's just something that that team can then go turn around and use um, as an advocate. We also have, so we, we recently did a, another large uh, data poll, which looked at the best times to post on social media. I thought this was a nice nugget to add here. There is um, specific to healthcare in terms of driving new engagement. And again, this is looking at hundreds of thousands of messages. Um, do you wanna take a screenshot or we can share the document afterwards? Um, the best times to post from Sprout Social. This is a look at Instagram. And we have Twitter. Uh, sorry, that one says Instagram, but this is um, Facebook, 
Twitter and Instagram. And then kind of the final thing wrapping up, because we talked a lot about social media engagement and how important it is. I think the one thing, if the takeaway would be, is to improve that social customer care. Because in a recent index we did from Sprout, consumers believe that one of the industries that needs the most help with social customer service, healthcare is ranked five. So I think just being there, being present, is definitely going to help um, help your social media marketing and, and drive those new patients. So, and then if we just talk about uh, at a at a quick glance, increasing your social media investment and why to spend you know more time. Uh, the Stewart Healthcare case study that I mentioned, uh, you know, Stewart manages community hospitals across the United States and Malta. And, you know, since leveraging Sprout to help increase the, the social media publishing that they do, they've seen 43 million increased impressions, 142,000 uh, social media engagements, and 109,000 link clicks. So I think just, you know, just knowing that there is that level of investment that you can increase and, and you know, see some great results. So... This is the time where we had other questions and tips. And I think one of the great ones is that uh, Kristen, you know, had mentioned it's um, it's a great thing to do to encourage marketers to reach out to other departments to see what questions are coming through live chat, um, some of the FAQs that are coming in via phone calls, and to help develop content around these. And is that a strategy that um, you've both employed, RJ and Chelsea? Um, yeah, definitely. I think that we, you know, there's so many things that I wish I could just like pour out, but I don't think we have enough time for that. But one thing that I like to encourage, um, you know, our providers to do, or one thing that we always do really, is we send out a voice document at the beginning of our relationship so that we can know what these uh, providers are wanting to sound like on their social media platforms, you know, just so that we can have an idea of what type of content we can share for them and how they want to sound. You know, are they wanting to provide certain information? Do they want to steer clear of certain information just so that we have that on the front end so that we can know, you know, what to expect during our relationship. So I think it's that's something that we definitely would recommend uh, just getting to know your providers, having that relationship, you know, set up on the front end so that it kind of makes the process a little bit easier as you go. And then you can jump into, you know, approvals of content and things like that. So um, that's probably my biggest tip is just getting to know who you're going to be working with and what they want to sound like on social media and how you can utilize it to grow their brand. Perfect. Yeah. And as we're rounding out the hour, um, unless we have any other uh, questions or tips from the panelists, I think I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. Yeah, this was a lot of fun, Michael. I appreciate you guys putting it together. Um, I think I'll close with one other statement, uh, which I always like to start with whenever we're kind of getting uh, stopped by our hospital leadership uh, and we're trying to figure out how do we start? Because leadership isn't 100% buying into this, how can we get started? One thing that all leadership teams want is uh, some kind of measurement or some kind of reporting. And I always say, what gets measured moves. What gets measured moves. If you start putting your social media analytics in your marketing reports, inevitably, your leadership team is going to start asking, hey, what are we doing to influence these numbers? So I would say if you need to get started and you don't know where to start, start by just putting the analytics of your social media presence in a marketing report. Start measuring those things. Yeah, that's perfect. And for the residual questions that may come in, do you mind, um, what is the best channel to get in touch with additional questions? Is it your Twitter handle or? Like always, we, you know, we monitor and we watch those things all the time. Feel free to tweet at us at iprov online. Find us on Facebook. We'd love to connect with you there. Find us on Instagram. Uh, me personally, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me at RJ Martino on Twitter. I'm active there. Uh, you can also email me directly or call me. Uh, I'm sure we can share my contact information in some way with the participants as well. Perfect. And as always, uh, we're at Sprout Social for any of the other questions that you have that come through. But uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Sarah, Chelsea, RJ. This has been a great session. Great. Thanks, yeah, thanks so much. All right. Thank you, everybody.